just to reiterate the introduction, I'm Sharon Denny. I'm the program director at the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration. That means that I'm in charge of our um, caregiver and professional education and support services. So I hope you have a chance to get to know um, us throughout the day today a little bit. I don't know if you recognize Picasso's um, pictures of Don Quixote. I don't really have any evidence that Don Quixote knew anything about FTD, but if you look at some of these words, you may wonder for a little bit. Um, Don Quixote was on a quest. Other people didn't really understand his quest. In fact, some people thought it was quite absurd and that what he was looking for was ridiculous. Now I ask you, do you ever feel that way when you're looking for community services? Do you sometimes feel that you're out there asking for services and people look at you like, I don't know what you're asking for. I don't understand the needs of your loved one. Um, we are all on this quest together. So today I've invited Cervantes and Don Quixote to join us a little bit. Our goal is to find services that are aware of FTD, first and foremost, that are friendly towards people with FTD, and ultimately that are specific and can serve the specific needs that people with FTD have. I don't really need to remind you in great detail, but part of why this is so difficult is that we are talking about rare disorders and different needs that are not well understood. Um, the numbers that our organization uses, and it is very difficult to estimate prevalence and incidence of these disorders, but we estimate that 50,000 to 60,000 Americans are affected by FTD if you include all the different subtypes that were described earlier. One little interesting footnote is that um, the same number is used, about 30,000 is the number given to the people in the U.S. who are affected by ALS. 30,000 is roughly, more or less, hopefully Dr. Grossman won't scream when I say this, about the same number of people who are diagnosed with behavioral FTD. But guess what? One is much more well understood and recognized than the other. So our work is cut out for us. Another reason is that we're talking about disorders that generally have a young onset. Up to 70% of people diagnosed with FTD are younger than 65. Um, so most of the services in the community that are dementia related, that are aware of and understand dementia, are for an older population, which means they may not understand what it's like to serve somebody who's physically active, mobile, looks pretty healthy, and has some different challenges that they're coming in with. The symptoms, you heard a lot about this this morning, the symptoms overlap with many other degenerative diseases, but there are some unique challenges to this population. They are poorly understood. Um, we are in a part of the country where we're fortunate that there's resources and people that are starting to work in these disorders. But believe me, we stretch across the US and into Canada, and there's a lot of places where people are at even a greater disadvantage than here. They're progressive disorders, so the needs that you come in with are going to change over time. And the constancy of that change is a huge challenge when it comes to finding and securing the right types of community services. So if you add up this equation, you get something that people in the field call caregiver burden. I think Gary alluded to that this, this earlier today. One of the things that we know about frontotemporal degeneration, and there have been a couple of studies that are starting to look at comparing the burden that you all face with that of other types of caregiving, and it is higher because of some of these reasons of why it's so difficult. So, you know, there's no question but that the need for supports and services, again, that Gary talked about earlier, is magnified for you folks, for all of us, um, a couple of times over. So as Cervantes can tell us, there is a way that you can move towards success. Um, in every case, the best remedy to fear is, th is to take action. And so, um, one of the things that we're going to do is look at, you know, can you identify what you need to learn and what you need to do to learn what you need to learn? So some of the things that we're going to look at today are, have been alluded to earlier in the day, but information, skills, structure, support, and inspiration are the elements of success in this quest that we're on. There's a number of ways that you can help yourself by taking a look at these aspects of the services you're going to be in search of. First of all, the, to understand the disease. And again, this we had talked about. But 
you know, if your quest is not just for services, but also for that satisfaction in the new job that you're taking on, to have the confidence and the satisfaction that you're doing the best job possible, you do kind of need to understand the landscape. And of course, that's why you're all here. Um, but there are aspects of the disease that you really do want to tune into. There's a lot of medical language. Um, a lot of times at this point in the day, people come in, they've learned an awful lot from our scientists and our medical friends in the morning, and their heads are spinning. Um, you don't have to remember it all. You don't have to retain it all. Just know that it's out there so that when you encounter questions or you have um, conflicting information that you're hearing, realize that there are resources where you can return, circle back, and pick up more information as you go. It's an entirely um, consistent learning process where you add more information as you go along. And so the feeling of being overwhelmed that you started with earlier today subsides some over time. And you can begin to integrate information more easily and more fully as you go along. So there's the medical language. There's the alphabet soup. The subtypes are important. You do need to know um, what symptoms your loved one has, what the clinical terminology is, and then ultimately, as we heard too about the research, and I'll mention that again, but to be able to understand what the differences in pathologies are, most importantly, to know how does it relate to you in the surfaces you need, the opportunities that are available to you. So you don't have to master it. You just have to know some of the questions to ask and how to put the information together. To do that, you want to be able to know where your reliable sources are. Um, and anybody who uses the internet knows you can go out and you can find all kinds of information. Um, some of it's very good, and some of it's going to take you down paths that you'll really, really be sorry for. Um, and so how can you discern what's a reliable source of information and what isn't? Well, you have the people at Penn, and you know your medical centers and the academic centers that are working in these diseases. The NIH is always going to be a reliable source of information. So start with your foundational sources and build from there. We're a reliable source of information. We're very blessed to have um, many, many very fine and uh, dedicated medical advisors who help us out when we have medical questions. And so one of the things that we hold ourselves to at AFTD is to make sure that we give you reliable information so that you know you can trust that. So you do have to ask questions and look for those sources of information. One of the things that we hear all the time that is the hardest thing for you all is that many, many of these questions that are the heaviest that weigh on you can't be answered. What is the life expectancy of my loved one? What is the rate of, prog of, of progression? What will the symptoms be? How do I know if I'm going to have to deal with that or with this? And those are questions that do not have answers. These are very complicated disorders. And for as much as Dr. Grossman or we would like to be able to answer those for you, they, they don't exist yet. We're getting closer to being able to have a sense of the differences among the subtypes for life expectancy and prognosis, but nobody can predict what your experience is going to be like. So one of the things to realize is that when you find yourself asking these questions and getting stuck on the questions that don't have answers, that's when it's time to move on. Because your quest is to find these resources that can help you now and to help guide your way down the road to the next stop. In terms of current information about research, you do want to pay attention to this. And you're all here, and you have. There's a lot of exciting things happening in the world of research. And being familiar with these issues, being comfortable asking these questions, and knowing where you can go to get answers to them is an incredibly important resource because there will be opportunities for clinical trials that some of your loved ones might be eligible for. They're not out there now, but if you start to learn about some of this stuff now, then when they're available, you'll be ready. You'll know what applies to you and what doesn't apply to your situation. So some of the things to pay attention to are the ones that were talked about this morning in terms of diagnostic techniques and this word biomarkers, um, drug development, clinical trials, and the chromosome 9 discovery. It's overwhelming, I know, but if you take it in little bits, you'll be surprised how much you can learn and pick up along the way. So we have some additional words from Cervantes. And this, I think, um, really Gary could have said this earlier today in his talk, that our greatest foes and whom we must chiefly combat are within. And so there's an awful lot about caregiving that is simply a skill that you can learn. 
We don't often think of it that way because there's some things that you think about, I don't want to learn how to do that. <laughs> Believe me. I could really do just as fine without ever knowing how to do X, Y, or Z that you think about when you look down the line. But it's important to realize that these are skills. And the same way you learned how to ride a bike, and the same way you learned how to cook um, vichy soise, you know, you can learn some of these things. Um, so remind yourself, you know, when it feels really daunting and it feels like it's impossible, that there are things that you can learn and you don't know unless you try. And it was just like the young woman in the back um, earlier had said, don't underestimate your family and friends. Don't underestimate yourself that if there's things that you need to learn but you have avoided, you probably can learn them. And there are people and services and resources that can help you. The other thing about skills is that, you know, look around you. There's other people who can do some of the things that might now be might most frightening to you. So those are the resources that we want to help you connect with. Um, if at first you don't succeed, don't give up. Keep trying. This disease gives you lots and lots of opportunities to try again. And please, please don't be afraid of making a mistake. I can't tell you how many times people come and they're very, very afraid to try something because they don't want to make a mistake. You can't make a mistake. The only mistake you can make is not to try. The other thing you'll realize is that sometimes there are skills you don't need to learn after all. And that's what was being referred to earlier. A lot of those um, kind of day-to-day -day things are wonderful ways of farming out and getting other people involved. I also have as the first skill the idea of maintaining your own health. Um, it, it, we'll underscore it again, and you've heard it before, but it really is important to maintain your health first because if you get behind the eight ball on that one, it's a really, really complicated thing to come back on top of. Um, and the asking for help is also critically important. There are skills that go along with navigating the healthcare system. I would venture to say that there are skills that go along with navigating your way into and around any large university medical center. <laughs> um, finding your way to Dr. Grossman may be easier the second, third, or fourth time around, but how many of you were frightened to death to have to come into Philadelphia and find the University of Pennsylvania? Um, you know, I live and work in this area. The first time I had to find this building, it took me a little extra time. Um, it's a skill. Remind yourself that you can learn these things. Um, you know, you, you are the one who's the CEO of the caregiving team. You create the team and you anchor it. But that doesn't mean you have to have all the answers up front. You will learn as you go and figuring out um, the ways to navigate is just asking the questions, integrating the information as you go. Home management is a huge area of new skills. How many people are in long-term marriages, long-term relationships, where you've divided up the tasks at home forever, and you've really forgotten how to do the other half of the jobs if you ever knew, or if you ever cared in the least, the other half of the jobs? These are some of the things that, again, you, you can learn to know the, one, the ones that you need to know, you can learn, other people can help you, and there are also in this category lots of things that maybe you don't need to know. Maybe you don't need to know how to do the lawn, but somebody else can help you with it. Managing symptoms. This is also a pretty daunting area of work for you. Um, managing symptoms is a whole set of skills. You know, there's, it's important to realize that the, um, you can't change the symptoms, you know? Your loved one is experiencing all these difficulties because of a disease process that they have no control over. Most of the symptoms they don't have any control over. They're not going to be able to change. They're not going to be able to integrate new learning. They're not going to be able to do the rehab of restoring skills that are starting to be lost. But you can change. You have to pick that up. Um, it really does become one of those extra things that falls to the caregiver to learn how to manage these symptoms, to figure out what can you do, what can you adjust, where can you change to make things better, to keep them um, as copacetic as possible. And there are lots of things in this area where you can learn. Um, and a lot of really important and valuable resources to turn to. And you know, the the subtext of this entire talk is that you need those specific FTD services. And in most cases, they're not out there. Um, so what do you do in the interim? Well, there are lots of other ways that you can turn to, to close approximations 
and integrate the information that you need. You, sh you bring the information about FTD, they bring their area of expertise, and you get a really good, rich resource that can benefit everyone. And communication is one of these areas, I think, that's a really good example of this. So, you know, one of the things you can do is you can start to learn how to change the way you send and receive messages. So somebody with PPA can't make themselves talk faster. Somebody with semantic dementia can't make themselves understand the words that are now gone. But you can find ways around it. Um, and there are people who can help you. So, you know, there are a lot of resources through caregiving.com and other dementia-related resources, the Alzheimer's Association, the National Aphasia Foundation, um, where they can tell you and talk to you and help you to look at the, what are these communication techniques in general, where, you know, it is slowing down the rate that you speak, tuning into nonverbals, using a lot of eye contact, using general... Um, gentle touch to redirect people. Those resources are out there. There's the opportunity to um, use technology a little bit now. But one of the real critical things that folks with FTD often aren't told is that speech and language pathologists are really an important piece of this puzzle. And at a center like Penn, you can access speech and language pathologists and they're part of some of the teams. Out in the community, it's not that easy. Um, Speech and language pathologists are generally used to helping people with strokes rehab. So if you have a stroke, you may have symptoms that look like the kinds of things that people with PPA have, but they can get better. Somebody with a stroke can work with a language therapist and they can relearn skills and then they're discharged and they move on. That doesn't happen in your world, but the expertise that a speech and language pathologist has is valuable to you because they can help to do an evaluation of the specific language skills that are needed or that are lost. They can bring some compensatory techniques. Their value is not so much in rehabbing of those deficits, but in teaching you, but in evaluating and in teaching you how to work with the person, how to maximize the communication abilities that are still intact. Now I'll say this, there's a lot of speech and language pathologists out there. Not many of them know about FTD. So the other area of work for you is as that advocate. Um, very often, AFTD, we say our biggest role and our biggest asset is to give you tools, to give you information, to help you put together a kit that you can take anywhere you go. So it's a really, really good practice for you to find some of your favorite articles that describe the subtype or the types of symptoms clinically that your loved one is experiencing find information that you find is reputable. I hope it'll be from us. We'll give it to you, we'll send it to you. Put it in a folder, add some information about your loved one. Add some information about what you know works with your loved one, whether it's in language or it's in behavior. Put together a packet that becomes your lifeline and take it with you everywhere you go. So you could walk into a speech pathologist's office and say, you know what, I'm here, I need services, I need your help. I don't expect you to really know too much about this disease yet. But how about if we work together and the partnership that we create will help my family member and help the next one coming in the door after me who has PPA. Now, should you have to do this? No, I would like it to be a lot easier for you to find the resources that you need. But it does work this way and it works very well. So I would really encourage you to put together the materials that you think make the most sense for your situation and have that be part of your toolkit a physical packet of material um, to help raise awareness, to help create that partnership so that the providers know what you need and they know then how they can bring their expertise to help your particular situation. In terms of behavior situation, behavior symptoms, you know, the old reminder that the symptoms are symptoms but the behaviors are purposeful. That doesn't mean you're always gonna understand them. You might not always ever, you might not ever be able to figure some of them out. But one of the things to remember in terms of the skills that will help you to manage this um, journey is that a lot of the behaviors that you'll see day to day may be related to things in the environment. They're gonna be related to triggers that you can identify if you kind of put on your detective hat and start to look at them in a different way. Um, the most effective treatments for many of your family members are going to be 
when there are changes in the expectations that they are living with and that they're under, changes in the environment that they are surrounded by, and changes in the approach of the people that they're encountering. And these are all areas where there are resources that can help you. They're not going to be dead on. They're going to be a close approximation, and then you take it from there. And we'll help you, as will the other you know, professionals who are working in this field. Um, there are resources on managing behaviors in dementia in general, and they're very good that are out there. You can find them through the Alzheimer's Association. You can find them through caring.com. A lot of these things are now pretty readily available. The place where our folks get stuck is when you say, yes, but that's not really my situation. And that's true. And the more that we can develop and perpetuate specific resources that will be helpful, the more you have extra tools. But don't ever let that not quite perfect match stop you from trying, because we need to get out there and raise the awareness together and help feed people figure out how to deliver the services that you need. Um, one quick example in this area that you know what, I'll be talking to you in a minute about partners in care, and I have a great committee of people that I'm working with, and over and over and over again in the, our conversations, people will say, well, what about the stare? What about the stare? How many people have noticed in their loved one kind of an intense blank stare? Now, how many of you have had people react to that in a very threatened, frightened kind of a way? You know, for folks who are in a facility, what happens very often is your loved one comes in at 62, physically active, not real communicative, kind of on the go, looks pretty healthy, you're telling them they're very, very impaired in certain areas and they need this supervision, and the staff member will say, um, gee, what, you know, what would you like for dinner? And the patient stares. Now, you may know that that's not really anything. It's not really a particularly threatening or an angry look, but the staff around them are reacting as if this person is, like, they're not responding the way they expect them to. They're not answering the question. They're being difficult. They're being ornery. They interpret that stare as a very threatening kind of a behavior. And then a lot of things happen as a cascade from that interpretation that most oftentimes really are not true. So by being able to marry the information that's out there on behaviors in general and some specific information about these symptoms that people may encounter in someone with FTD, we can make the services get better for what you need. A whole other area of skill is personal care and assistive technology. People with mobility impairments, there's great, great resources for being able to accommodate your home, for ensuring safety with alarms and those kind of things. They're out there. We're not going to duplicate them. You just need to be able to find them, and it's pretty easy to do so, um, and, and match them to what you need in your particular situation. The same is true with personal care. And uh, again, I don't know if she's still here, but the young woman who mentioned, you know, well, we, we could change his diapers. We could do that. You know, a lot of people are really most intimidated by the idea of taking on those personal care tasks when it comes to caregiving. Um, it crosses some boundaries we just don't usually think about. And so for as long as that's the perspective, they're going to be really hard ones to tackle. But if you can kind of put on your managing care hat and realize those are skills and there is information about dignified and gracious and effective and skillful ways to take care of those things, that's all part of what you can move into if you need to. The other folks who are wonderful in this regard are OT, PT, and speech people for a lot of these skills. Now again, the resources are there. They're not going to be ready to serve you when you come in the door. If you come in and say, you know, I'd really like to have an occupational therapist help me figure out how to arrange things at home so I can make mealtime easier and my loved one has FTD, you're going to need to be ready with that information so you can explain what FTD is and why somebody who's 55 needs this service why it's not going to necessarily be covered by Medicare unless you're advocating and can figure out well, Medicare, you know, if, you're, if you have the disability coverage and you have Medicare, you might have a chance of getting it coverage. But a lot of these services are not naturally referred, naturally um, mentioned to you unless you realize they have the potential to benefit you and you go after them. 
but you can really um, incorporate a lot of information from these areas. Now, we had a couple of dog illusions earlier, and I've been quoting Miguel Cervantes quite a lot. Uh, this is not a quote from Cervantes, but I really like it. It's actually from my mother-in-law, who's a really smart lady, and um, raised eight children, seven of whom were male, and I think probably said this a lot. Um, and there's nothing demeaning in this idea in the least, but it really does help to be smarter than the dog. Um, and, you know, being smarter than the dog means that you know what has, to have, what has to happen, that you just sense it. You know where you need to go and what the destination is. You have to be able to get inside the motivation of the other, whether it's the doctor, whether it's the healthcare system, the insurance worker. Everybody has a reason why they're doing things. If you can understand their reason, that will help you get that much further down the line. It also works with, the, with your loved one. If you can get inside and understand that these symptoms are not under their control and maybe figure out some of the clues and the triggers behind the behaviors, then you'll have a much better chance at figuring out the finesse, the art of caregiving. Um, again, Gary mentioned kind of being sneaky. A lot of times in FTD, you'll hear the term fiblets. There's a very dignified, creative, important role for lying in this area, and I include it as a skill that you're going to want to learn. It's not deceptive, but it is a tool that you can use and you can learn. Structure is another one of the things that we've been moving our way towards. Um, the constantly changing nature of these diseases means that you're always going to be adjusting. Um, you're always going to have to be nimble. Just when you think you have things somewhat balanced and underhand, they're going to change on you. And so if you can set up an overall game plan in your head for what you're doing now, what you need to do now, and where you're going to go down the road, it's going to be really helpful. You won't feel like you're in control. And I wouldn't pretend to tell you you're going to feel like you're in control. But you have a road map, and you have a sense of where you want to go. The anchor to that is routines. Having some routine in your life, even knowing that it's not going to work day in and day out, that you have to be flexible and adjust, but having some structure that you're looking to plug activities into each day is really, really important. The structure might be something you're doing at home. It might be something down the line that a facility or a day program is providing. But any structure should in include and consider some of these things. Um, there is a caregiver here who has um, done a great job coming up with a full day structure of activities for her husband from within a whole framework. Um, and some of her articles are on our website, which I'm happy to point you to. But you really want to take into consideration not just the needs of your loved one, but their interests and the resources and everything that's around you um, to try to figure out how you can maximize their engagement in the community what can be flexible over time? How can it adjust? You always have to evaluate for safety. You want to consider all the options that are going to be in your world, potentially down the line. Consider them early when you don't need them, when it's not a crisis. Know they're out there. Be aware of them. Know how to ask questions and where to get that reliable information about them. And don't forget to build into the structure some respite for yourself. One of the best ways that I can tell you a little bit about how this idea of structure works is to introduce you to Carl. Um, Carl was diagnosed at 54. He was a very active guy. His wife is a nurse, and she knew she was going to have to keep working. So she really recognized that Carl was going to need an outside source of structure um, earlier than she would have might have liked otherwise. Um, his planning and organizing skills were pretty impaired. And he needed help to start tasks. Once he got going, he was doing OK for a while. Um, so she went out and she found a day program in the community, which was just a regular um, adult day program. And for 20 months, Carl was a volunteer there. And the program didn't really understand FTD when he walked in the door. They actually underestimated his need for supervision on several occasions, um, but recognized that it was pretty easy to work with him in his particular situation, as long as he had somebody help him get initiating and started tasks, he would do a lot of volunteering things um, and help out with different clerical tasks and whatnot within his abilities 
in that day program. And so for a fairly long period of time, that was a good solution for them. And Sandy, his wife, is a pretty savvy caregiver, and she had already started to collect information to share with the program. She added to that because of her experiences with the first day program. And then as Carl's needs began to increase, and he was able to slip out of the facility that wasn't a secured facility, she did find and move him to a secured day facility. Um, he was still involved and still thought he was volunteering. He never understood that he couldn't work, so he thought he was volunteering, and he was able to continue there for a while. He had uh, additional difficulties with incontinence, and his cognitive skills declined. He was still pretty resourceful. Um, so he actually was able to get out of the secured facility. Some of you might relate to that. Um, but they didn't give up on Carl because Sandy was very involved and encouraged them. And what they did was they worked the door checking routine into what he did every day. So one of his jobs in this facility was to go around and check that all the doors were locked. <laughs> and don't you know, it actually worked for quite a while. That became his job. And he didn't ever go out through that door again because it was his job to make sure they were locked. Um, his needs continued to increase. And Carl moved on to assisted living. And you know, for him, assisted living was not a really good solution. Um, it was attached to the day program, so they thought it might be a nice transition. But after only a short stay, they recognized that he did need more structure and more support from the staff and moved to long-term care. And Carl's now in the second long-term care program. So now this one person has been through many different services, but each time they've been able to find what they need and they've been able to make happen what they need to have happen. Not everyone's that lucky, I realize, um, to have resources available and the means to access them. But the message really to take away is that the resources that are out there can do a much, much better job if you help them to learn what you need. Support. Even Don Quixote needed Sancho Panza. So you've heard a lot about support and the importance of it. Informal support. We've talked about, I don't need to go over that. The formal support we've introduced. Again, one thing I want to highlight is um, counselors and therapists. Very important resource. They're out there. There's many, many good ones. Don't underestimate their ability to learn and serve what you need. Again, if you go in the door, they're not going to know what FTD is. They're not going to know and understand the intimate challenges of your life but they have expertise that they can bring and share with you and help you the way you do need it. So part of it is that, no, you're not going to find the exact match. You have to find the best match possible and take it from there to move it to the next step. The specific needs, you know, other FTD caregivers are the key. They really are the key, and you are going to benefit so much from connecting with them. There are more FTD support groups all the time. We're at a process now where we're starting to be able to identify and reach out to specific groups for that little additional match. So people who are um, adult children have a different perspective in caring for their parent. We're trying to make some supports available that are going to speak to that. Um, we are now aware of a couple of resources for patients who are diagnosed because their perspective is, again, different, and they need and deserve supports that speak to them. The last section here is animation. I mean, what animates you? So um, you need that inspiration to keep you going. <coughs> Figure out what inspires you. What's going to move you beyond the ordinary things in your daily life? Somebody mentioned grandchildren earlier. I was really happy I had this slide in here. There's a lot of different sources of inspiration. And I just really encourage you to tune into what yours are and the people. You found out today, I'm sure, that there's a lot of inspiring stories here. Um, among the other folks attending this conference, make sure that you stay connected with those people because there's so much to learn from them. Your quest is our mission. So some of the resources here are echoed on our website. But these are some of the things you can for sure rely on when you're looking for information about the diseases or about research. Local resources, we don't have a lot of real specific local resources. So sometimes we're pretty limited in what we can tell you. Your Alzheimer's Association is going to have a good command of those dementia-related resources, and the FTD support groups in your area or even close are going to be a fabulous place to connect with people who have tested and tried some of these other community resources that you need. 
The FTD specific groups are growing. There's a bunch of them now. There's 64 in the US and Canada. It seems like a small number. It's way higher than it was two or three years ago, so it's getting better. Um, we'll help to match you. If you don't have a group in your area, call us. We'll figure out a way to get you connected with some folks. Uh, it's a little commercial for some of our things. I just want to mention we have respite grants. Uh, respite's important. We think it's so important we'll pay you to arrange some respite. If you're a full-time caregiver, you can apply for a $500 grant once a year. Um, and we want to encourage you to use those. The partners in FTD Care, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. We've had three packets out there that we're raffling off. This is an education initiative for community providers. And so I encourage you to just look uh, into this a little bit more if it's um, something that could be helpful for you. And while um, my friend Don Quixote and Sancho are there, I'm going to pull out the winners of those packets. If your name is pulled, just come to the table at the end and we'll give you one of the partners in care packets that you can take to facilities and providers you're working with. So, our winners are Phyllis Backer. Phyllis? Oh, great. See us at the table. Kim Marnian. Kim won. Kim really wanted to win. Kim's a day services provider. And Rich, Richard Kramer. Great. Thank you.